Hi everyone, I'm Logan Williams and I'm one of the Arise Hello. Festival volunteers. I'm chairing today's session where we'll be seeking to answer some of the most vital questions facing the both the left and the Labour movement and progressive movements more globally going forward, which is the need to push for peace and to declare no to the forever wars. And today's meeting couldn't be more pressing. As earlier this year, the Science and Security Board, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist, moved the hands of the doomsday clock forward to 90 seconds to midnight. The closest to global catastrophe it has ever been, even during the height of the Cold War in the 80s. It's vital today that the left and the Labour movement attempt to tackle the questions driving this drastic change and how we go about trying to bring that doomsday clock in to have a bit more time such as trying to work out how we unite the world for peace, how we end the new Cold War and the nuclear arms race. For our discussion today, we're joined by the ever amazing Kate Hudson from the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, Steve Howe, former Di Deputy Director of Strategy and Communications during the 2017 general election campaign for Jeremy Corbyn, Shadra edwards Dashti from the Stop the War Coalition, and Nick Dean from the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into hearing from these fant fantastic speakers. If you can, please donate at the link provided in the chat on, if you, on YouTube. And if you haven't done already, please make sure that to buy a ticket for the whole of Arise, the Festival of Left Ideas. We need to sell hundreds of tickets to cover the cost of the amazing month we're enjoying. And they start at £4 each. So it, it enables us to carry on building, to build bigger and better, hopefully some a mixture of in-person and online events. And if you've already got a ticket, why not become a friend of Arise for £5 a month and help us to expand and continue on? Hopefully you'll agree, great work. So that's enough from me. Let's get started by hearing from Kate Hudson, General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Take it away, Kate. Yes, well, thanks very much, Logan. It's good to be here for this important discussion. Forever Wars sounds terrible um, and absolutely working out, strategizing how we can begin to help deal with that terrible situation. It is fundamental, not just for the peace movement, of course, but for the wider progressive movement. And the slogans peace and socialism have always gone hand in hand. I and mean, it's never been more important than it is today to reinforce that connection, particularly because the war in Ukraine has created a new and uniquely dangerous situation, uh, not just in terms of war fighting, although of course that is a disaster, particularly for the people of Ukraine at the moment, but it's also altered the political balance in Europe and it's accelerating militarization very, very rapidly. And that is having a profoundly negative impact on our societies, and that will be the case going forward. Of course, the crisis hasn't come out of nowhere. I would say that looking back, we missed a big opportunity to put peace on a stable footing at the end of the Cold War. People will remember that the Warsaw Pact was wound up in 1991, and at that time, there were hopes that NATO would be dissolved too, and that internationals would, international relations would be founded on a new basis. Principles of the UN Charter could be put into force, and so on. And looking back, there was great hope at that time for a more just and peaceful world, a world built on political agreements and not on military alliances. And it was also hoped, of course, that there would be a peace dividend with vast sums going from military spending into social spending. And of course, that just did not happen. And instead, the US devised a new strategy in 1992, the Wolfowitz Doctrine. This stated that the US was the world's only remaining superpower and that its main objective was to retain that status. And of course, that approach has determined US actions ever since the, the forever wars agenda, let's say. And of course, NATO was repurposed to support the US in that objective. And that has, of course, included expanding its remit and its territory. But that US goal 
ignores how the world has changed, that we now live in a multipolar world and trying to force it to remain unipolar will just lead to more wars, to the forever wars. And, and that is really the global framework in which we are currently existing. And that is the huge challenge for us. So as Logan pointed out at the start there, um, doomsday clock, the hands of the doomsday clock, 90 seconds to midnight, that's the highest the risk of nuclear war has ever been. That's higher than even during the height of the Cold War. And this increased risk, has it's been recognised um, around the Ukraine war. I mean, some tabloid headlines have talked about World War Three and so on, about nuclear catastrophe. Um, there has been that recognition. But what is very shocking is the fact that that recognition hasn't actually been acted on in the sense that people who can do it do something about it, haven't actually said, this is very serious, the world could be destroyed, let's dial back from that, let's de-escalate, let's deal with a nuclear problem, let's bring about negotiations to end the war. No, they haven't done that. And of course, our government, which has been one of the most gung-ho, has actually done things that increase the risk of nuclear war. So that's the kind of terrible situation in which we find ourselves today. Thinking back to the early, very early on in the war, there was a lot of concern about a no-fly zone, that if NATO tried to enforce a no-fly zone, it would immediately put Russia and NATO at war. That would become a nuclear war. Of course, that didn't happen. Good. But what we've seen since then is a kind of series of incremental d developments that have actually upped the risk without it being that huge big thing like the no-fly zone. So, But taking those uh, developments together, it is um, a, a very bad situation. So, for example, one of the things relatively early on was the starting to talk about tactical nuclear weapons, that's kind of short-range nuclear weapons, as if somehow they're very small things that you would just use on a battlefield and pretty much the impact would be confined to the battlefield. Just absolute nonsense. And if you look at the data about tactical nuclear weapons, um, a lot of them are many times the power of the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for example. You know, there's no way um, that it's possible for that use to take place in some kind of contained way. Um, but of course, all that talk about that is just a way of normalizing the idea of nuclear use and, and kind of softening us up for it. And then, of course, at NATO summit last year and summer of last year in Madrid, um, NATO reinforced its nuclear first use policy and so on, you know, so kind of ratcheting up there. Um, the latest bad development, of course, um, is Russia has announced that it's going to send nuclear weapons to Belarus in July. That's coming up pretty soon. Um, interestingly, um, of course, Russia said when it first said it was going to do this, it said it, it's fine, we can do that because NATO already does this. You know, NATO already has this kind of class of nuclear weapons in Europe. That's fine. They can do that. So we can do the same in Belarus. Well, there is a certain logic to that because, yes, NATO does have these nuclear weapons in Europe, in other people's countries. And in fact, it's actually in the process of upgrading those uh, nuclear weapons to make them uh, targetable attack weapons. The reality is that neither of those things are legal under international law. Neither NATO nuclear weapons in Europe nor Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus, they are equally uh, breaking international law and equally unacceptable and must be made to stop. Okay, so that's, there's that, but that, that's a very dangerous thing, both the uh, Russian nukes in Belarus and the B-6112s coming to Europe, so bad. Um, so, and then, of course, when you look at the wider context, and I'm sure we'll hear about this from uh, our Australian speaker, the wider context is the agreement, the AUKUS agreement between the US, UK and Australia, whereby um, the US and UK provide 
Australia with nuclear powered submarines. Okay, they're not nuclear weapons submarines. Okay, that's good, but they're nuclear powered submarines and the nuclear reactors use weapons grade uranium. So there's a whole question about nuclear proliferation there. So that's an increasing danger. And of course, uh, AUKUS is the attempt by the US uh, to bring Australia into its global framework for its global maintenance of its global domination. And of course, um, orientating to uh, ho hostility and military hostility to China. So a very dangerous and difficult situation. Just one um, final word, Logan, if I may, just to say something about environmental risks, because of course the doomsday clock scenario, the 90 seconds to midnight, that is actually based on nuclear war threat, but also environmental catastrophe threat or actuality. Um, and we just need to recognize uh, how, um, how much uh, war and the military plays and what a role they play in environmental degradation and the whole kind of environmental catastrophe that's ongoing. And a recent UN report um, said that the Ukraine war will lead, leave a toxic legacy for generations to come. And of course, depleted uranium munitions, which our government and now the US government are uh, sending to Ukraine, you know, radio, radioactive um, impact of those munitions, that's only the most extreme form of the weaponry and the impact, the leg toxic legacy impact of weaponry in Ukraine. They face major pollution of water, land, ecosystems, Absolutely. and so on. So it's absolutely uh, disastrous. And of course, as we know, the military emissions are excluded from, or they have a let out from the Paris climate agreement. Governments don't have to actually announce um, what's going on in terms of uh, their military emissions. So very, very bad situation. Um, well, so what, what can we do to change both of these things? Well, obviously, um, working together, international solidarity, international cooperation amongst peace movements, but also amongst progressive forces, uh, socialists, people on the left, other campaigns working together to be really focused on this, but also to recognize that the global dynamic itself is changing, and this can be a framework for our work too. So we're seeing the rise of the global south, the economies of the global south, the BRICS economies overtaking the kind of G7 type economies now, and, and a real standing up by uh, many, many countries in the global south um, to say, actually, that's your war. You know, NATO wars are a disaster. You know, look at the war on Afghanistan and many other wars, refusing to uh, buy into that framework anymore. So things are changing globally. We need to be part of that. We need to be making those links. We need to recognize that peace is the answer and peace is the way forward. Um, fighting this war in Ukraine, you know, to the last person is not an answer to anything. That would just lead to more problems and it will lead to irresolvable problems. We need to have dialogue, negotiations, and really work to peace work for peace and a peace settlement which is in everybody's interests not one side or another benefiting and doing down the other it has to be for the benefit of all to really truly resolve those problems thank you very much thank you kate for that fascinating contribution there and really setting the framework for what's going on in the world at the moment and what we can hopefully do about it so let's move on to our next amazing speaker, and that is Steve Howe. Steve, take it away. Yeah, just picking up on, on one of the points that, uh, to begin with, that uh, Kate made about the depleted uranium uh, warheads. I mean, I think one thing that really does need emphasizing here with, with the gung-ho people in Britain who are talking about, you know, fighting this, uh, you know, dr driving Putin, they always say, driving Putin out of 
Ukraine, um, is that these warheads are being fired into Ukrainian territory and into places where Ukrainians live. And so the contamination from that is going to be, uh, you know, the, the contamination of Ukraine. And one, you have to assume that either this is an act of self-destruction or there is an assumption on the part of the U Ukrainian government and the West that they actually aren't really trying to to, to retake that territory, i.e. Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, they've kind of written it off. And 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 are they happy just to dis destroy it and contaminate it? Because otherwise, why would you be firing, um, you know, depleted uranium uh, warheads into that area? It doesn't... Uh, it doesn't stack up. But as Kate said, and, and you said in your introduction, this is a really serious uh, situation. I'm, I'm old enough to remember quite clearly, actually, I'm that old, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, and, and even more clearly the uh, Reagan-Thatcher um, uh, sort of relaunching of the Cold War after, after a period of detente uh, with the deployment of cruise missiles in Europe. And both of those uh, periods were pretty scary um but 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 this is worse and and as even uh the uh, uh I, I forget his name now i've got it here somewhere so let, let, me, let me just find it uh e e even the um uh the head of the uh i forget what his name is the security czar the times calls him sir stephen lovegrove uh is alarmed by the communication failure the fact that uh, there are no um, there are no channels of communication at the moment uh, between uh, the United States, China, and Russia in terms of the, in, like there were during the Cold War when when there were back channels that were always open uh, to to ensure uh, conflict. But um, Sir so Stephen Lovegrove made the point that um, that the world superpowers. Uh, this is him speaking. Uh, the world superpowers understood each other better during the Cold War. So uh, it is a very serious situation. And for those of us arguing uh, for uh, some kind of peaceful solution to the war in Ukraine, um, it can be a lonely experience uh, and, and quite an intimidating one. I mean, you, you know, when I'm posting stuff on social media, sometimes I think twice about it because I know I'm going to be bombarded with people calling me a Putin poodle and uh, uh, and a lot worse. Um, but this is an existential threat. This is really serious. And I think those of us who want to try and argue the case for peace have to be brave and have to be thick skinned, uh, just like people were. Actually, I don't remember this in the 1950s when um, I'm writing a book about this at the moment about, you know, you could be arrested in the United States just for collecting signatures on a petition against the Korean War or against nuclear weapons. Um, but we do seem to be uh, getting into that kind of uh, environment. But we have to be brave like people were in the 1950s and continue to fight uh, for our uh, position. And I think what's heartening is is the fact that um, as Kate pointed out, um, in global terms, uh, the majority of the world doesn't buy into the NATO narrative and actually wants to find a solution. Um, and surprisingly, um, e e e even here, uh, people don't, they may not, actually, I'm not sure they realise it, but they, they don't buy into the, uh, the narrative because there was an opinion poll done towards the end of March this year uh, where it asked people, uh, what they thought uh, um, the strategy should be before seeking, the West strategy should be before seeking a peace agreement. And the options were to recover all territory lost since uh, February 2022, when Russia fully invaded, or to recover all territory lost since February 2014, including Crimea, Donetsk and Luhansk. And perhaps surprisingly, by two, nearly two to one, um, people said recover all territory lost since Russia invaded, not all territory to the the border as it was uh, in February 2014. So 48% said uh, territory since Russia invaded, 26% said uh, territory lost since 2014, which is the position of the government and the position of the Labour Party. Um, and then 25% said they didn't know. So the, a clear majority of people are not in support of the stated 
uh, objectives of, of the government or, or or the opposition. And yet you would hardly know it because the, the media is sort of unanimously uh, very gung ho uh, about you know this 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 won't end end until the last Russian uh, has left, and you have to wonder whether when they say things like that, whether they actually really mean driving people out of uh, those eastern areas of Ukraine who broke away in 2014 because they couldn't accept the way things were going and the um, you know some would say revolution, some would say coup that occurred in February uh, 2014, and they and they broke away. And 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 you know what 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 is, what are people really saying? Are they saying that those people in those eastern areas um, who don't accept that should be driven out of the country? A massive exercise in ethnic cleansing. So um, I think um, Kate is absolutely right to stress the point that any piece has to. Um, take into account the interests of all all the parties here. And when I say all the parties, I also include within that uh, countries in Eastern Europe, uh, Russia itself, but particularly within Ukraine itself, recognizing the fact that there are, uh, you know, this has arisen because of an irreconcilable, or seemingly irreconcilable conflict within Ukraine over what country they want, what kind of country they want to be uh, and who they want to be aligned with. Um, and and so if you if people say a ceasefire has to depend on the Russians leaving, what they're really saying is the war has to go on forever, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, and we need a ceasefire. And I think a ceasefire um, has to be pressed for urgently. Um, and and I think there's a strong case for saying that the ceasefire should be based on uh, the ceasefire line that existed prior to the Russian invasion move back to the status quo as it was before the Russian uh, invasion, which was being monitored by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And it wasn't a, an exactly peaceful ceasefire line because there was a lot of um, incidents across it. Incidentally, the majority of them going in the direction, in, going in an eastwards direction. Um, but 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 at least there is a basis for using that ceasefire line uh, and using the OSCE again. And as I say, I'll come back to the OSCE in a minute but i think the initiative that's encouraging is the the one that's taken place recently with the african countries um going to uh, kiev and then going to moscow it was poor, cold water was poured on it by the western media and it may well not produce anything but but at least it's an attempt to get the discussion going and at, and at least they had meetings with the two principal uh, patragon but protagonist sorry I, I, my tongue is tied around that I think irrevocably so I'll, I'll move on uh, but they had talks in Kiev and Moscow and uh, and 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 uh, they had a hearing and they heard what both parties had to say so let's hope that uh, something uh, comes of that um, but it is significant we are seeing um, a shift now in in the world that I think is quite encouraging. Um, a, a member of the German parliament described it as a tectonic shift in international relations, uh, the erosion of some 500 years of Western hegemony and the end of the, of the unipolar moment of the US empire. Um, and when you when you think about it, the the divide in the world is is based on that 500 year divide. The G7 are the four principal European colonial powers, plus the United States, the major colonial power of the uh, 20th and early 20, 21st century, the Japan, Japan, which the Japanese empire and Canada, which is an offshoot of the British empire. Um, it, it's an anachronism. The world as we see it at the moment is dominated by declining colonial powers um, and, and increasingly the uh, the countries that were colonized, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa particularly, are, are asserting themselves through the vehicle of BRICS uh, and through the kinds of initiatives that we saw um, recently with the uh, African countries going to Kiev and uh, Moscow. Now, it's an eclectic group of countries. They're not, um, they're not uniform politically, um, but they're united in wanting to break out of this uh, U.S. hegemony, um, 
uh, and and the Americans, you know, lack the self awareness often uh, to to even appreciate it, and, and and they think that they can divide them against each other. So, for example, recently you had a U.S. Congress committee issuing a policy statement on Taiwan, saying the United States should should strengthen NATO plus its NATO plus arrangement to include India, India, right? A, a public document, but they they forgot to ask India. So the, the Indian foreign secretary said a lot of Americans still have that NATO treaty construct in their heads. It seems almost like that is the only template or viewpoint with which they look at the world. That is not a template that applies to India. So an own goal there uh, on the part of uh, the United States. Now, I don't think any of us want to replace one block like NATO with two blocks. Um, uh, and and the good news is BRICS says that it doesn't want to be a block in that sense. It's, it says it wants to strengthen multilateralism and uphold international law, uh, including the purposes and principles enshrined in the Charter of the United States as its in indispensable cornerstone. Um, so while you've got the, the G7 unilaterally trying to impose their narrow worldview and their interests and their concept of a rules-based order, which is their rules, what we do is good and what everybody else does is bad. The Global South are explicitly talking uh, about the UN Charter and building a genuinely uh, democratic uh, international order. And, and that's where I come back to the point about the OSCE, which, you know, hardly anyone's heard of. But it, it was a product of the detente period of the Cold War, the 1970s. And it, it, it was actually an organization that brought together every single country in Europe and Canada and the United States uh, to, to try and uh, work together to reduce tensions uh, and as a forum for, for disarmament. And it survived, it still, it still exists. And the one useful thing it did recently or over the last recent years was to try and monitor and maintain the ceasefire uh, in Ukraine. Um, and. And so strength, strengthening those kind of organizations and strengthening, obviously, the United Nations itself, I think, um, is, is extremely important. And as part of that process, um, building the pressure for arms reduction, getting the arms control process uh, restarted, uh, or at least for start ending the, the new arms race, and then, and then beginning to uh, achieve arms reductions. And we've recently had, and I'll end on this, we've recently had Rachel Rees saying under a Labour government, uh, we aren't going to be able to afford the Green Prosperity Plan that they promised, £28 billion pounds a year. Uh, the economic situation has changed and it's unaffordable. Um, in practically the same week, John Healy, the Defence Secretary, said uh, arms spending will be whatever it takes. So it's completely unlimited. It's completely not within the uh, parameters of what Rachel Reeves was talking about. Imagine if we could achieve that shift of that spending uh, into the Green Prosperity Plan. Imagine if that money could be spent on renewable energy and cleaning up our rivers and, and, and beaches, building houses, home insulation, public transport, education. I think, you know, this is the vision that we've got to try and win people to uh, in this country that, um, you know, stop for a moment and and stop framing everything in terms of us against Putin and start thinking about this new world that we now live in and how we could try and build a multilateral world uh, in which there are stronger international organizations, in which we move towards arms reduction and in, in which we release resources to really tackle climate change and really increase living standards and develop a more equal and just world. Thank you for that, Steve. Um, I'm sure there will be some elements there which we'll dig out into our discussion later on. Uh, just very briefly now, sort of halfway through our four speakers, we're going to just quickly hear from one of our one of my fellow Arise Festival volunteers, Sam, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about the festival and what you can do to help us. Sam. Hi everyone and thanks so much for um, joining us today. Um, so a few things just to bring to your attention. Um, first thing is a plea. Please, as Logan said at the beginning of the call, if you haven't bought a ticket, uh, please do. 
all events are free at Har Arise, um, but we we need the resources in order to run uh, run these kind of events, run this program of meetings and um, and sessions. Um, so if you buy a ticket, a solidarity ticket, that really really helps us. Um, there'll be a link post uh, posted to that in the YouTube live chat. Um, same too with the um, uh, with the donation link as well. Again, all your donations really really help. Um, please give what you can what you can. Um, it makes a real material difference. Um, second thing to say um, is the festival obviously isn't over yet. Uh, we've got a few more sessions left to go. So our next one will be with um, Jeremy Corbyn and Friends, A World to Win. It'd be fantastic if you can join us on that call. And we'll also be concluding uh, the festival with our final rally, um, strike back against the Tories and the profiteers for a socialist future. So it'd be great if you could come and listen to the amazing uh, lineup of speakers from trade unionists and campaign activists um, on, on that rally. Um, I look forward to seeing your names in the chat at that as well. Um, final thing to say, um, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but please buy a ticket, please donate. Um, <laughs> we, we, we're hearing about um, today, you know, the, the kind of the global structures that are in place for that the ruling class to, to hold on to their power. Our ability is based in our ability or our power is based on our ability to help each other and organise. Um, so any help you can give in terms of resources for running the festival will be absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. So please do donate um, and please do buy a solidarity ticket. And um, thanks again for joining us today. And thanks, Logan. For, for letting me have a, a couple of minutes. That's a, okay, and just to make sure, just in case anybody had missed that there, just I think Sam mentioned it a couple of times there, please do buy a ticket for the festival that will really help us out, will really help us to continue to grow, which is obviously is our aim going forwards. So we now are going to hear from our second two speakers. So we're going to hear from Shadia edwin Stashti from Stop the War Coalition and Nick Dean from the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. So thank you very much for having me. I just want to start by hopefully not being too dramatic, but trying to emphasize just how dramatic this situation really is. We are absolutely in trouble, edging closer and closer to the brink and point of no return when it comes to the war in Ukraine. What makes it worse in this day and age is the potential for this to reach nuclear. It's never been more possible than it is really right now. Here we are 18 months on from the war in Ukraine. Ukraine, as we know, is undergoing one of the most severe humanitarian crises uh, since um, the World War II, really, since Europe has ever really seen. At the moment, there's absolutely no end in sight. Yes, we're hearing of this uh, summer now counteroffensive that uh, Ukraine is waging. It hasn't really taken off yet at the same time we see Russia simply throwing more and more uh, people, bodies onto the front line. And we have a stalemate situation with neither backing down. That's the reality. Clearly now we need to see another route and we need to see another tactic. That tactic is negotiations on the table, aiming for peace talks now. I want to look at the United Kingdom's response to all of that, which has not been to seek an end to this war. It never has been. Uh, to seek an end to this war. It's only ever looked at trying to escalate uh, this war to its own gains, to its own gains on an international political stage. And really, that's why we, as people here in the United Kingdom and internationally, should be extremely worried. What we've seen Britain do over the last 18 months is adopt a vanguard role in pushing for increasing offensive military weapons to the region. That includes tanks, it includes fighter jets, uh, and even tank shells too. Where is this magic money tree? That's what we're looking at here. Where is all of this money coming from that's funding all of this? As we know, the United Kingdom has given billions of pounds in military assistance. In fact, we've sent 2.3 billion pounds last year, and we're seeing that being matched this year and even above uh, uh, this year as well. So support for this increase in spending comes from both sides of the house. It's not just the Tories that we're talking about here. We're also talking about the Labour Party too. Keir Starmer, when he went to visit Zelensky, he said if he were to become the Prime Minister, there would be no difference between a Labour government and a Tory government when it came to supporting the war. Isn't the opposition's job to oppose? Well, we don't see it here at the moment. What we do see, though, is dots are finally being connected. We've been saying this at Stop War Coalition very, right from the very beginning, 
of the war in Ukraine, that the dots need to be connected between the war and the cost of living crisis. As billions of pounds are being spent on military assistance, as I've just mentioned, what we're seeing here is almost every sector in society in Britain has been on strike, millions of people plunging below the poverty line. We've seen uh, numerous families having to make the decisions between eating or heating their house in the winter. Yes, we're no longer needing to heat their house, but many parents, hundreds, thousands, even millions of people are going hungry so that they can feed their children. We have a huge cost of living crisis. The government's not doing anything about that, but it puts hundreds of billions of pounds into uh, wars abroad and military assistance. And this is a really catastrophic situation that we see ourselves in. As I say, we are slowly, slowly connecting the dots and we are winning these arguments. If we take a look at the trade union movement here in the UK at the moment, we see that the UCU, that's the University and Colleges Union, voted to oppose the continuing war in Ukraine, including arms sales, and to support the campaigning of the Stop the War Coalition against British government policy over the war. So this is a huge, huge success for not just the Stop the War Coalition, but the anti-war movement in general. Previously, though, we were hearing rhetoric that it's bad when Boris Johnson uh, attacks working people, but it's good when he flies to Kiev and uh, snaps any chances of peace talks. Similarly, with uh, Liz Truss, it was really bad when she was wrecking the economy overnight, but great when she was advocating uh, endless confrontation in, in preference to negotiations. So I want to ask the question, you wouldn't trust the Tories on the economy or public services. So why would you trust the Tories when it comes to war? At least the UCU has actually overcome this kind of dilemma, this kind of question. And we are seeing this trend being reflected across the trade union um, movement in various capacities over the last year. This public opinion needs to grow and grow and grow. We need to make this minority a majority. That is our job as activists in the anti-war movement, because we know the powers that be seem to believe that Russia will back down. We know that that's based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. If Putin is backed into a corner, it will be incredibly dangerous. We are talking about a nuclear arms state. We are talking about the crux of something that could really, really escalate. For our foreign policy, military, uh, for our foreign policy to be based on Putin accepting a military defeat is really and truly a massive gamble and a risk. It's a gamble by the very same strategists that were responsible for taking us to a disaster in the war in Ukraine and Afghanistan. Then again, I want to bring up the Labour Party. Of course, there's no room for any criticism anymore, any discussion of this at all. Keir Starmer has been very clear about this from the very beginning. A year ago, a year and a half ago, he threatened his MPs with the loss of the whip if they dared to criticise NATO. In so doing, he effectively silenced, gagged, the entire anti-war voice in the parliamentary party and it has remained silent ever since we then look at the media that also has a major role to part uh, role to play uh, in waging uh, and orchestrating and escalating uh, the agenda uh, of this war too because every conflict comes with its own propaganda offensive the war in ukraine is absolutely no exception the western powers the ukrainian government the russian authorities they're all working flat out to maintain popular support for the deadliest military mobilization in Europe. The establishment has been very successful in creating this black and white paradigm, a consensus in support of the war and a never ending push for arms and more arms and more arms and more arms. We have been told we have a binary choice. If you speak out against the war, you deride as being pro Putin, a Putin apologist. Or if you actually go the other side, you're being told you're anti Ukrainian. This war has become a war between Russia and the US and NATO that's being fought on Ukrainian soil with Ukrainian blood. It's our job to bring a sense, uh, a sense into all of this madness that's being orchestrated. Don't forget when two million of us marched against the war in Iraq, it was the media and politicians that were against us. That included the Observer, that included the Guardian, and of course we had a Labour government then too. <laughs> With a lack of opposition to a government uh, like this, this is where Stop the War Coalition takes that place. This is where the anti-war movement needs to take that place. Because as we know, this is a war that's being conducted by some of the most powerful military powers 
on the planet with their own interests. The movement here should be supporting voices for peace in Russia and Ukraine, not backing our own government's war effort. The West's total uh, talk of victory is completely deranged. It's got nothing to do with any concern of the Ukrainian people, only with their own geopolitical interests. Now, one thing I just want to end on is that if this doesn't lead to a wider catastrophe and we still have time to stop it, the war, as Zelensky himself even said right at the beginning, will end in negotiations. That is still a possibility and that needs to come now. I want to start by going back to 2003 and the invasion of Iraq, because it quickly became clear that Australia had been hoodwinked or suckered into going into that war by the USA. Now, you'd be forgiven for thinking that that might have done damage to the trust between the two nations and that the USA's next military initiative might have been treated with a modicum of doubt. But no, just eight years later, in 2011, the Australian government, a Labour government under Julia Gillard, agreed to US Marines being stationed in Darwin in the Northern Territory. More or less permanently, these are foreign military forces answering orders from Washington, not Canberra, on Australian sovereign territory. They now have a well-established foothold. That this represents a chink in Australia's military armour was never a consideration. And to make matters worse, their presence certainly conveys a distinct message to China. Anti-war pro activists protested and pointed this out at the time, but our protestations were, of course, ignored. The 2011 announcement made by POTUS Obama in the Australian Parliament was followed in 2014 by a so-called force posture agreement that in effect hand sections of Australia's territory over to the US military to do with pretty much as it wants. Annual meetings between senior ministers of the Australian and US governments called OSMIN consistently bring about incremental concessions on Australia's part, all under the desire to constantly enhance or deepen the alliance between the two nations. There is, I believe, within Australia's military establishment, an inability to even think of Australia as a truly independent nation that is quite safe and absolutely capable of standing on its own feet. This inability is devoid of common sense. The establishment seems to be in constant, slightly pathetic fear of being left abandoned before one imagined aggressor or another, none of whom has ever, in point of fact, presented a genuine threat to the nation. The current perceived threat is supposed to come from China, but this is pure fantasy. There is no such threat, and in any case, no visible benefit to China from one. However, it is well known that the US now views China as a potential enemy because of its growing economic weight. And when this enmity is combined with Australia's fear of abandonment, the two complement one another. Consequently, Australia is all too eager to join the gang that the US is putting together to provoke and ultimately confront China. I'm convinced that this is the intention of the US-led empire. The latest and most disturbing manifestation of this process has been the AUKUS agreement, in which the US, the UK, sorry, the UK is another gang member. But there is some light coming in. AUKUS, although supported by the current Australian Labour government, incomprehensibly, is starting to get a rough ride. Numerous local branches of the ALP have already passed motions against it. The Queensland State Conference recently voted down a resolution in favour of it. And the Victorian State Conference, meeting tomorrow, seems likely to pass resolutions opposing it. So the ALP government, through its embrace of an essentially warmongering defence policy, is getting itself into trouble. The National Conference in Brisbane in August is shaping up to be very interesting. Meanwhile, a grassroots movement is growing in strength and popularity as more and more people find that there are some very troubling aspects in the AUKUS pact. It's the submarine component of AUKUS that is finding most resonance. 
Australia has never embarked on any nuclear program and resolved never to do so back in the 1980s. AUKUS threatens to overturn that resolution. We have no nuclear industry. Right now, we lack the necessary expertise to manage nuclear powered submarines, much less build and maintain them. The defensive usefulness of the submarines is being questioned because these are weapons of offense and we could have a large fleet of non-nuclear vessels which would provide better defense at a fraction of the cost. And the cost, of course, is immense. It represents money that could and should be directed to much needed social programs, hospitals, schools, housing, education, welfare. But what disturbs me most is the view of what is going on from the Chinese perspective. To China, it must be abundantly clear that Australia has taken sides with the USA and is, like the USA, preparing for a coming conflict. There's little doubt that should that come about, Australia will be, will be in it right behind the USA. And Australia can ill afford to be China's enemy. During World War II, the USA found Australia to be a safe haven from which to launch military operations in Asia. I believe that AUKUS is a means by which the USA is manipulating Australia into repeating exactly the same role, persuading Australia to provide ports for its nuclear submarine fleet is an early step in the process. So I am encouraged by the sense that this is an issue that is catching on with the Australian general public. And I hope we are seeing the start of a very broad campaign that will save us from the stupidity of waging war against China, our most important trading partner, simply because that is what the USA intends. Thank you. Okay, so I think we'll both agree, we'll all agree that both of those were fantastic contributions and really sort of set the tone for where we're going, where our movement needs to go. And I think it's really interesting there to hear a voice from Australia, which is something sometimes we don't often hear from in the British debate. So obviously we've got our two speakers in person. We've got Kate and Steve. So we're just going to start by putting a couple of questions to you, and then we'll allow some summaries within that as well. So our two questions for us both, which I'll take in reverse order, so I'll do Steve and Kay. Do you think there's a danger of the rehabilitation of wars for the ideas of humanitarian intervention that Blair put forward as the decades pass by since Iraq? So do you think that that's going to start to come back? And how does the US being in decline affect attitudes and divisions in the British ruling class? especially with regards to foreign policy. Yes, Steve, when you're ready, do you want to take us away? Then? On the question of um, the wars of intervention, I, 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 you never can tell, but I, I do think after the um, debacle of Afghanistan and, and the whole history of, 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 these, of these regime change wars, that certainly my feeling is in, in the States, there is a lack of appetite uh, for that, that model, if you like. Uh, I think a lot of people in the States are quite happy with, um, and I, I, I go there a lot, I've got dual nationality. Uh, uh, a lot of people in the, uh, in the States accept the idea or go along with the idea, I'm talking about the public in general, go along with the idea of you know, supporting Ukraine fighting against somebody and army you know spending billions of, of pounds and uh, dollars in doing that but when it comes to actually uh, american forces on the ground boots on the ground then i think there is is a real uh, re reluctance to, to 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 see that happen again beyond the fact that there are obviously lots of american troops on the ground in lots of places but actually fighting a big war i'm talking about i mean there's still u.s troops in it, it, two two u.s bases in iraq for example i mean they haven't actually withdrawn from iraq in spite of being asked by the Ar iraqi parliament to leave they still haven't gone um but 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 i mean leaving th those kind of things aside um there you know the appetite in the United States for a war involving substantial numbers of American forces on the ground in a country, I th I, I, th I think is is pretty low. Um, and, and it's actually lower on the Republican side of the equation 
uh, amongst Republican voters than it is amongst Democrat voters, because Democrat voters have been more swayed by this liberal interventionism kind of argument. Um, uh, and, and I think it is interesting uh, going over to this point about the, the way the world is divided. And I, I, th I think the sort of middle class liberal uh, elite in these countries have been very accustomed to um, their privileges and their position in the world and being able to pontificate about what should go on in the world and how everything should be. And to the extent that they're ever um, empathetic towards what's happening in the global south, it is in a rather patronizing way uh, but as soon as the global south asserts itself, um, the sort of uh, uncon well, unconscious, maybe conscious in some cases, racism comes into play. Uh, and it's almost like, well, what, what does the South African president think he's doing going to Kiev and Moscow? Who does he think he is? You know, um, so so I think there's that kind of um, there's that 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 kind of attitude. But I don't think there's a big appetite for uh, a major intervention. That's not to say it won't happen if the if the elite in Washington think it needs to happen. But I think they're going to have a real problem with American uh, public opinion on the question of the decline of the U.S. Just briefly and, and Britain's position. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, th I think that the way Britain has gone, um, can, I mean, there's obviously two views in within the British elite about this. There was the the view that uh, prevailed when Cameron was prime minister. Uh, which was to to engage with with Russia and with with China um, and and build the British economy through um, you know attracting their investment and trading and so on and that's now shifted over to follow the American line of uh, uh, of of a trade war and hostility and and you know I, I think like with Germany and with France you know what we're seeing at the moment. Is is these um, European uh, colonial member, uh, former colonial powers, members of NATO, uh, act, actually acting against their own self interest, um, and their you know their economies being in difficulty because uh, they're following the U.S. line. Now you know whether or not within the British uh, establishment the penny will drop and somebody will say, well, hang on a minute, this is actually not working for us. Uh, it's hard to say, but I I think at the moment I I think the, for the foreseeable future, um, the uh, the British ruling class is willing to be, uh, and thinks it gains some kudos from being the United States' biggest useful idiot on the planet. Okay, and um, over to you then, Kate. Yeah, very interesting questions. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I think that um, looking, I mean, in terms of the kind of Blair Bush concept of humanitarian interventions, you know, and the whole kind of theorizing about it and stuff from, you know, the attacks on Yugoslavia onwards and, and so on, I think that that kind of approach. I think that's probably finished, um, and I agree with Steve around it, the, the idea of mobilising large numbers of troops to send around. That's, well, I think that's not going anywhere for now, let's put it like that. But in, in terms of wars and interventions anyway, however you describe them or how they might be dressed up in that kind of pseudo-ethical kind of framework, the reality is that over this period, NATO has not just expanded into Eastern Europe and all that, it's actually gone global. So, you know, Colombia and Latin America, all these global partners, lots of intervention in Africa, you know, so there's, there's stuff going on. There are wars and interventions going on. They're not just dressed up in, the, in that way that they were before. And of course, as well, there's other kinds of interventions, not just the military interventions, there's economic interventions, in other words, economic warfare against places. We see that a lot in Latin America. And then, of course, over the last decade, we've seen the rise of so-called lawfare, which again, of course, we've seen a lot in Latin America. So it's like they may they are kind of nuancing and diversifying the ways in which they uh, wage war, not only in in terms of new tech, you know, in 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 warfare and AI and all that kind of stuff, but other forms of warfare too. So I think that whether or not we ever see a kind of an attempt to rehabilitate the humanitarian intervention, let's just be very alert to the fact there are actually a lot of um, lo a lot of interventions going on. And then in terms of um, the US decline thing. Um, 
Well, that, that is quite an interesting one. So just as a slightly different uh, take on it, you know, in terms of like the special relationship, so poor between the US and UK, and of course, we've recently had some kind of anniversary of that and the soon that visit and all that kind of thing. And it's interesting that since well, what I personally consider to be the disaster of Brexit, you know, <laughs> anti-Brexit person, you know, but there was all that hope, you know, from people, you know, government type people who were trumpeting about that, that yes, we could really reinforce the special relationship with the US and we'll get great trade deals and all that. Have there been any great trade deals? Well, no, you know, and that was reinforced again. So um, that only goes so far, the special relationship between the US and the UK. And what, where it really goes is expecting Britain to kind of poodle along behind in support of the US's retaining global domination mission. And as we saw with Johnson over the, the AUKUS deal, you know, when he was still prime minister, really hoping to get some jobs in <laughs> nuclear manufacturing, you know, sort of trying to get these sort of crumbs from the table, economic crumbs from the table. And I mean, in the recent integrated review of defence and foreign policy and all that kind of stuff, very clear that Britain was sort of self-styled, you know, second lieutenant or whatever of the, the US project and, and very much pushing for the US perspective within NATO, because even within NATO, there are kind of differentiated positions particularly. Um, well, anyway, so differentiated positions. One thing just I'd like to finish on in terms of this is the special relationship is to remind people that uh, every 10 years, the US-UK mutual defence agreement comes up for renewal in Parliament and in the US Congress. And this was first signed in 1958. It's what secures the kind of mil the nuclear weapons agreements between the two powers um, and also other military stuff. And it's thought to have elements within it, secret, that um, underpin the kind of special foreign policy relationship too. That it usually goes through on the nod, you know, it's just put on the table and, and it goes through. But I think it's really important that when it comes up next year, 2024, there is actually a really serious um, political discussion about this in the movement and also a really serious attempt within Parliament to get it properly debated, you know, because it can't just be the case that something from the height of the Cold War reinforced, you know, reinforcing the nuclear weapons relationship, that just keeps on going. We've got to try and put a stop to that. And so I would urge people to start getting it into their kind of mental diaries that we need to be addressing that. And, and on that, Logan, I would just say, I would just really urge everyone to get involved in the peace and anti-war movement at this very, very dangerous time. And all voices um, must be employed to call for peace in Ukraine. You know, the Ukrainian people have suffered enough. You know, the land is suffering there. You know, talked about depleted uranium and environmental problems. You know, that has to be brought to an end. And it has to be brought to an end uh, whereby all the considerations and all the needs of the peoples involved are met. Common security approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Kate. And co totally agree with that last statement there. Uh, just want to take the time to thank all four of our speakers. Uh, obviously, two of them pre-recorded, but still fantastic contributions. And I would like to implore all those watching or listening to check out the rest of the Arise Festival. If you have missed any sessions, you can find them recorded on our YouTube. And please keep an eye out for our extra ones. As Sam said, we've got a fascinating one uh, on Monday the 26th with Jeremy Corbyn and friends, which as a Peruvian democracy campaigner, the party president of the party of the European left, and lots of various other big names of the international progressive movement. So it'll be really fantastic to have you with us. Thank you all. Have a lovely day.